My name is Michael Barron. My wife's name is Sophia Dawes Barron. I'm the executive editor of the American Globe in Chicago. She is the senior vice president of Sirius Publications. We have two children, Michael Jr., 23, and Ashley Sophia, 21. Jr. is a senior at Princeton studying international diplomacy, and Ash, as I call her, is studying underwater basket weaving at UC Berkeley. Both are excellent students. We both earn very good money, and she makes a little more than me. We were happy, at least it seemed so to me. We were looking forward to a fantastic weekend alone. She had had a very busy week and had been looking forward to this party for a long time. She was wearing a new dress, black open back, strapless, with a slit about five centimeters above the knees and a small slit on the left side. She was wearing the diamond necklace I gave her for our 25th wedding anniversary. Earrings with sapphires and a ring are a copy of Princess Diana. Her blonde hair was combed up. She looked stunning. I was wearing a Brooks Brothers tuxedo. She stood over 15 feet away, leaning back against the fake fireplace, drinking from a glass of champagne, laughing and giggling like a college student. I had no problems with this. He was a scruffy, slimy-looking bastard who chatted with her, lightly touching her arm, her shoulder, whispering in her ear with his smug grin. He just said something to her, and she nodded her head affirmatively. Okay, this has gone far enough. It's time to save her from this predator. I put down my old-fashioned glass and was about to come to her aid when a soft, feminine hand grabbed my elbow. Do not do anything. Your wife is under his spell and his thugs are watching you. I looked down at the spectacular brunette standing next to me. She pointed to a stern-looking man about five meters to my left who seemed to be watching only me. She then pointed to the balcony doors and there was another man standing there scanning the crowd. He's going to take her out onto the balcony and try to do something to get his point across to her. He will probably try to grope her and put his hand in her underwear. That's what he does. If your wife does not give in to his advances, he will choose someone else. But he almost never leaves the game. Without trying. I watched as my smiling wife walked with Mr. Shit across the balcony and out the door. The two thugs closed the doors and took up positions. I turned to the woman who had a sad expression on her face as she took a sip from her whiskey glass. Who are you, and how do you know all this? This is how I was seven years ago. I was shocked. Lana turned my back to the doors to the balcony and continued to explain. I was here with my husband, supporting the Children's Society, and we were having a good time. We were about to receive a large donation. He started chatting with me. The next thing I knew, he was patting me on the back and inviting me to go out onto the balcony. I was fascinated by his good looks and followed him to the balcony. On the street, he grabbed my breasts and asked if I liked it this way. I was stunned but excited. He twisted my chest just enough to make me gasp, then slid his hand under my dress and under my tights. He penetrated my underwear with two fingers and found my erogenous point. I felt instant pleasure. Then he made his proposal. He'll take me home for the weekend. We would make mad, passionate love, and then I would return home a one-time thing that will never be repeated. I had to go back to my husband and tell him I was going away with him for the weekend. He stood behind me and watched, and then we would leave. That's exactly what I did. My husband was an accountant, and this devastated him. When I returned home from the weekend, he didn't even look at me. I told him there was nothing we couldn't handle, but he never had pleasure from me again. We started to move away from each other. I started walking at night in search of casual acquaintances. He closed in on himself. His job began to suffer and he was fired. I came home one night and found him hanging from the rafters in the basement. I spent seven months in a hospital psychiatric unit. My three children were from 14 to 10 years old. They refused to talk to me. Someone told them what happened. My parents went to court to get custody. I have no idea what they are doing even though I have visiting rights. As soon as they are old enough, they file for emancipation and then refuse to see or talk to me. She looked at her watch. It took about 15 minutes to convert me. She was there around 12, and I, with these words, she said to me, Don't turn around. Don't look at them. Ignore them. If she talks to you, refuse to look at her. She's going to say that she has something to tell you. If she does, say what you think you want, and we'll leave. Together. It will piss him off, and it might make her change her mind. 
This may be the only satisfaction you will get at the moment. We'll go somewhere and relax and talk. You can do it? Hide and watch. He heard her footsteps as she approached him from behind. She placed her hand on his left forearm. Michael, I have to tell you something. I pulled my hand away and growled at her behind my back. Get away from me, accessible woman. Do what you're going to do. But if you don't come home tonight, don't come home at all. It's all over between us and I will destroy you. You have more to lose than me. Miss Lana. I extended my hand to her and we left. Michael, I need to talk to you. Now. It became quiet and people parted to let us pass. We headed towards the entrance. How did you get here? I asked her. Car service? Let me, I said. They drove my Lincoln to the entrance and opened the door. She got in and I tipped the young man on the driver's side, picked him up and drove off. I know a place where we could go and talk, if you don't mind. Great offer, Michael. I need a drink. We went to Corral. The place I knew was relatively quiet and catered to a middle-aged crowd. We parked, walked in, grabbed a table at the back and ordered drinks and potato chips. She told me her story, what was left of it, and I told her about Sophia and about myself. She was a college professor, and her career took a hit when this story came out. I told her that I was the executive editor of the American Globe in Chicago. I served six years in the Air Force in the 17th Special Forces, an operative, and worked as a reporter and newspaper man for almost 20 years. We had two children, a son, Michael Jr., and a daughter, Ashley Sophia. Both are attending college, out of state. So, what do you think you're going to do? Do? I don't even know how I feel, let alone what to do. If she's not home when I arrive, it'll be scorched earth time. She'll pay, and he'll... Oh, he'll pay. I... I... Oh, God. And I started crying. She took my hand and looked at me as if it was the end of the world for both of us. I studied her face and realized that I could get lucky if I wanted to. But I couldn't. Even if there was a chance, I couldn't. Look, I'm very sorry, but sex on the side is not for me. I have to go home and deal with this. Please give me your phone number and contact information so I can stay in touch and possibly pass information on to you. I also need the asshole's name so I can begin his destruction. She took my phone and entered her full name, Lana Tooley, and her phone number, as well as her address. Michael, you are a good person. You were treated unfairly. I was hoping for something more, but I can respect your decision. Go home and try to fix it. Good luck. I paid the bill. We got up and left. I took her home. She left and headed to her townhouse. I drove home and went inside. Sophia was not there. Okay, she made her choice. It was 12.39 at night. I took out my cell phone and called my best friend Steve Dawson. He was also my lawyer. We served in the Air Force together and always joked that he became a lawyer and I got a respectable job. A sleepy voice answered my call. Hello? Michael? What the fuck, Michael? It's a quarter to one now. Everything is fine? No, Steve, that's not true. I need you here at ten dollar this morning in full-fledged lawyer mode and possibly best friend mode. I need a divorce. Now I have his attention. I could hear his wife talking in the background. It's Michael. We have a problem. You were at that reception, weren't you? Sophia met Darren Wadson, didn't she? Oh, God, you didn't know. Just be here, Steve, please. For me. No problem. I'll be there. I started making a list of things to do. I looked up the contract mechanic's name and wrote down his phone number. Then I went online and found a site that paid cash for a car with a clear title. I bought her a BMW as a present for her 24th wedding anniversary. It was in my name. I wrote down their price and then went and packed her two tiny bags of underwear, two changes of clothes, and two pairs of shoes. I carried them into the hallway and placed them by the front door. Then I went to bed. I woke up at 7 a.m. and went to make coffee. I turned on my computer and went into the newsroom. I saw that Joe Spillane, the investigative reporter, was on duty. I called Joe and told him I wanted everything he could find about one Darren Watson. It was for my eyes only. It would be a favor. No problem, Chief. I'll get to it right now. Still no sign of my future ex-wife. 
It was almost ten and I was becoming more and more gloomy. I called the cash salesman and told him I had the car for sale and I was the owner. I told him the make and model and told him I wanted a quick sale. I don't know, two-year-old BMW. How much do you want? A luxury car like this can be hard to come by quickly. Two thousand dollars, I said. He stammered and asked, How hot does it burn? No, but you must be prepared to take cash with you. What is your address? he asked. I told him and he said he would be there in 25 minutes. Don't sell to anyone else. Wait for me. And he hung up. About 10 minutes later, while I was on the phone with the locksmith, my friend Steve showed up with his legal assistant, Dottie. We went in and I treated them to coffee and English muffins. About 20 minutes later, Andy showed up. I showed him the car and registration details. He asked me what was wrong with it. I told him everything was fine, but I didn't need another car. He looked at me strangely and wanted to know why I was selling it. I told him I was going to get a divorce and my ex-wife wouldn't need it anymore. Wow, I'm glad you're not divorcing me. They brought a flatbed tow truck and I signed and dated everything. Andy paid me and loaded the car. I shook his hand and he wished me luck. Still no whore wife. I entered the house and found my lawyers hard at work in the dining room. The divorce decree was drawn up and the injunction was ready. They were working on an alienation of affection claim. Steve asked what was going on with the car. I told him, I sold it. I do not need him. You didn't do anything illegal, a little gross, but what the hell? In fact, I'm impressed by the number of deterrents. So let's go online and take care of all your financial matters. For the next 45 minutes, we alternated between the bank, investment companies, insurance companies, cell phones, mortgage companies, and HR with my pensions. By midday, the missing wife was still missing and the locksmith had changed all the locks and added a keyless deadbolt on the front, back, and side doors. I took them to lunch and we met Steve's wife, Deidre D.D., at the Saltgrass Steakhouse. She ran up to me and pulled me into a hug that told me I was still a good guy. We sat down at the table and Dee Dee looked at me, expecting me to take the initiative. Finally, I looked at her and asked, What? She said she wasn't sure what the situation was, what my plan of action was, or if I did anything to speed it up. I did nothing but assume that my wife loved me. This fool stunned me, and I still can't get over it all. Is there any way back? Hell no! She's still not home, and perhaps the only way to avoid this is if she ends up dead. Dee Dee looked at me sadly, nodded, and said she understood. She couldn't understand what made Sophia do this. We talked for a bit, and then left and went home. I arrived around 6 ago p.m. and was still alone, without a wife. I fell asleep in my deep chair. I woke up at 7 a.m. and dragged my tired and aching body to the shower. I cleaned up the mess and did something I hadn't done in years. I went to church. The church was useful to some extent. I sat in the back and bowed my heed, praying for guidance and intercession. Nothing. God was hanging me out to dry. The mass ended and I lingered for a while, praying for something. I think I'm on my own. Let it be so. I drove home and had coffee at a fast food cafe. I returned home and parked the Lincoln in the garage next to my full-size 1980 Bronco. Pretty soon the weather will make this a daily activity. I locked the garage door and slid the deadbolt. Then I went in and turned on the broadcast. Football Bears. Lions. The first game of the season. Of course, the Bears got their butts kicked. Now this was my life. At 5.30, I received a message from the cheater. Already on the way? I'll be home in 20 minutes. The injunction came into force 30 minutes ago. Everything fell into place. 20 minutes later, I heard a foreign engine whine in my driveway. I looked out the window and saw some European piece of shit sitting there, and Sophia turned around on the passenger side. She leaned over and kissed someone. I could only assume it was Darren Wadson. She stood up, closed the door, and waved after him as he drove away. Then she turned and hobbled down the path in her four-inch heels to the stairs and up to the front door. She tried her old keys, but then realized that they did not fit the new electromagnetic locks. What the hell is this? She thought. She then noticed two small duffel bags to the side of the doorway. What the hell is this? She leaned on the bell, ringing it continuously. 
she shouted two or three times, Open this damn door, Michael. Finally, I stood up, walked to the door and opened it for my very angry wife. She looked at me with a death glare and asked what the hell was going on. Simple, Sophia. Your keys don't work anymore because you don't live here anymore. My ex-wife used to live here, but she's no longer around. Her eyes became huge, and she tried to pull me towards her for a kiss. But honey, she began, do not even think about it. I don't know where this thing was or who it was on. How many times have you had sex with this asshole, or how many times have you pleasured him? We made love, and it was wonderful. Oh, spare me. You were gone for two days and two nights. You didn't even call. I bet you haven't thought about your loving husband even once. You didn't take off your wedding rings when you caressed him. She recoiled in horror and began to stutter. At least you kept your anniversary necklace and earrings. Well, they were gifts, so they are yours. And I grabbed her left hand and took the rings off of her. But it's mine. And your wedding ring belonged to my grandmother. You remember when I proposed to you, don't you? You won't need them anymore. She started crying and was shaking. Why are you doing it? She blurted out. It was just sex. I had the right to this. My body doesn't belong to you. Some of her old boastfulness was returning to her. You need to get rid of your ego, Michael. We must continue to live our lives. You're right, and I tried to do it. Here, this is for you. I handed her the envelope and she just looked at it. What is this? She asked. Money. I sold my car, a BMW. I didn't need it anymore. You would have thought she had been bitten by a snake. What did you do to my car? It wasn't your car. I bought it for you. My name was on the title, registration, and insurance. I owned it freely and clearly. So I sold it. I thought it would be a nice gesture to give you the money. That's all. It's just, she sorted through the bills. What's here? Two thousand dollars? That car cost much more. What does all of this mean? That's all it was worth. Much like our marriage after a Friday night. I told you I would destroy you, and you had much more to lose than I did. The look on her face was priceless. Her eyes bulged, and she started whining again. How could you be so cruel? I'm back home to you. God, I guess I'm lucky. I freeze when I notice that there is no ring on her right hand. Where is Princess Di's ring, Sophia? The one you were meant to have. I wanted to make a real facsimile for you, but you said you liked the fake one. You just wanted it. So I bought this for you to make you happy. Where is it? Her face turned pale. She began to stutter. I, I, he, what is he? He wanted something to remember our weekend. She blushed, lowering her eyes. So, in addition to your body, you gave away a ring that you said you liked. She blushed and nodded her head affirmatively. I looked at my watch. 6.03 p.m. Get the hell out, Sophia. We're done. No, I want to get into the bath. I live here. No more, you won't do this. I slammed the door in her face and pulled the bolts. I turned around and leaned my back against the seven-centimeter thick oak door. Unbidden tears welled up in my eyes and I finally felt the pain. She started ringing the doorbell and banging on the door, screaming and begging me to let her in. I took out my cell phone and dialed 911. 911, what kind of emergency do you have? Police? fire or rescue? I have a restraining order against my future ex-wife. She's standing on my porch steps screaming like crazy. Please send someone. Faster! She continued to rant as I told them my name and address. A few minutes later, I heard the howl of sirens and, looking out the window, I saw two patrol cars with flashing lights drive up. Three male police officers and one female officer exited the vehicle. They approached the very angry wife, and asked her to move away from the door. They asked for her ID and wrote down her name and address. Then, while the female police officer was talking to her and one male police officer stood nearby, the other two came to my door. Just as they were about to knock, I opened the door and presented them with a restraining order. They read this and called the station. I then handed them Sophia's copy and told them that she would be served tomorrow. But I would appreciate it if they didn't say anything about it. One policeman approached my wife, handed her an order, and spoke to her. 
She read the document and turned pale, and then became furious. They held her back and she screamed, where should I go? I went to hell, Sophia. I don't care. The officers told her she would have to leave and escorted her and her luggage to the curb. She took out her cell phone and called a taxi. The police apologized and waited while she told the driver to take her to the Peninsula Hotel. She got into the car and drove away. Sophia came to work at the Serious Publications Publishing House. She took the elevator to the 10th floor and headed to her office. Her executive assistant was waiting for her as she was 30 minutes late for work. Jessica followed her into her office. This is true? Jess asked. Sophia became wary and looked at her friend and assistant. What the hell are you talking about? It's all over the office. You and Michael, you were at that party on Friday night. Sophia sat down at her desk. Yes, you know we did it. What did you do the rest of the weekend? I don't understand what you mean, Sophia said. You did it, didn't you? You went home with this creature, this sexual predator, and left Michael standing there. Oh, God, you poor, stupid woman. She sank into the chair to the left of Sophia's desk, covered her face with her hands, and burst into tears. Sophia was stunned and stared at her friend. How did you know? I didn't tell anyone or say anything. How did you know? Who else knows? Everyone knows, you stupid bitch. The whole company knows. And now it's only... She looked at her watch. It's only 10.45. Sophia turned pale and leaned back in her chair. Suddenly, her office door swung open and her boss, Gwendolyn Harrelson, burst into the office. She looked from one woman to another and turned pale. Oh, for the sake of all that is saints, it's true, she exclaimed. Sophia was stunned by the reaction of her boss and close friend. This situation quickly escalated. Sophia bristled indignantly and said, I think everyone is making too much noise about this. Oh, really? Gwen said, smirking at her friend's naivety. Do you know who he is and what it is? Why do you think all of Chicago and maybe half of the Midwest already knows about this? Sophia turned pale and looked down at her hands. What did Michael say? He said it was all over between us. He said he would destroy me the same way I killed him. Who does he think he is? He doesn't control me. I don't belong to him. He's your husband, you fool. What was Michael doing when you got home on Sunday? She looked at her desk and started sniffling. He sold my car. He said that he no longer needed it because he did not have a wife who could drive him. Oh my God, Gwen exclaimed. At that moment, the door slammed open and in walked Stephanie Jameson, vice president of mortgages and acquisitions for Chemical Bank and another close friend of Sophia. Angela, Sophia's secretary, followed her. Sorry, Mrs. Barron, she just barged in. It's okay, Angela. Come in, Steph, she said with some sarcasm. What the hell have you done? Just at that moment, Gwen's cell phone rang. Hello? Yes, Hank, I'm in her office now. No, we haven't heard anything about him yet. I'm just finding out the dirty details now. Yes, dear. I'll call as soon as I find out anything. Goodbye, dear. It was my husband. He wants to know if you've heard from Michael today. No, I haven't talked to him since last night, Sophia said. With that, she picked up her cell phone and pressed speed dial Matu. Her cell phone beeped twice and then said her service had been disconnected. She stared at the Nokia device as if it were a scorpion. He turned off my phone, she whispered. Gwen said, Oh, that's not good? Not good at all. Just then, Angela came in and said that a young lady wanted to see her. She said it was a matter of life and death. Something about your marriage. Sophia's office became cold and quiet. Let her in, Angela. A tall young lady with blonde hair, wearing a dark blue pencil skirt, ivory blouse, seven symmetrical heels and a dark blue blazer, walked in with a small briefcase under her arm. She walked over to Sophia's table and looked around at the assembled women. Finally, she stopped at Sophia, looked her straight in the eyes and asked, Are you Mrs. J. Sophia Barron, at least for now? Stephanie attacked her. Look here, princess. Who do you think you are? Yes, I'm Mrs. Michael Barron. Do you have anything for me? 
A terrible thought flashed through her mind of what awaited her. Congratulations, cow. You've been served. She handed Sophia a large manila envelope, took a photo, and turned on her heel. She walked to the door and turned to face the group. Seven years ago, my mother separated our family just like you. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a good day. Sophia's head hit the table with a thud, landing on the envelope she had received. Gwen rushed over and helped her sit up. Sophia's breathing was rapid and it was difficult for her to breathe. Stephanie took out her phone and pressed the speed dial button. It was connected to Michael's office. Chicago American Globe, Mr. Barron's office. Is there anything I can help you with? I would like to speak with Mr. Barron, please. This is Mrs. Stephanie Jameson from Chemical Bank. May I ask what's wrong, ma'am? This concerns his wife. I'm sorry, ma'am, but he doesn't accept calls from his wife. He asked me to tell her that she... Just give him the pipe, bitch. Please wait. Soon the connection clicked and Michael's voice came through the speaker. Well, Stephanie, the coven has gathered around this bitch. I'm guessing Jessica and Gwendolyn are present along with the queen of available women. What do you want? Michael, you're acting like an ass. She's hopeless and you're not helping her. What do you think will happen? Ask her what she thought was going to happen when she left for her weekend of great sex. Tell her to get a lawyer and talk to him. I won't talk to her until we sit down and talk to our kids on Saturday. Goodbye, Stephanie. Click. Oh, damn, Gwen said. You got carried away. Sophia hit her head on the table again. A loud knock echoed through the office, but no one rushed to her aid. Michael hung up and pressed the button to call his son in New Jersey. Michael Jr. was in a serious relationship with a beautiful young lady, and he hoped that this would not affect them in any way. But the conversation had to take place. The phone rang three times and his son picked it up. Dad, how are you doing? Not very good, son. How's Tara? She's okay, Dad. What's happened? Is everything okay with Mom? Physically, she's fine. I need you and your sister here for a family meeting on Saturday. Tara can come with you. On Friday, you will have two tickets at the box office. Janine will contact you with details. Don't ask any questions. Just come. It is important. Dad, what happened? You're scaring me. Son, I haven't talked to you like this in over ten years, but I'm doing it now. Now, do what I tell you and don't ask questions. He hung up. He wouldn't turn them against their mother. He would let them make their own decisions. He would trust their judgment. The conversation with his daughter was basically the same, just a little more emotional. She said she would see him on Friday. He spent the rest of his day in silence. He talked to his lawyer and his personal secretary about Darren Wadson's trial. Returning to Serious Publications, the woman gathered for a council of war, trying to support their friend. But it wasn't easy. Sophia muttered something and cried. What have I done? What have I done? She was inconsolable. She had no idea of reality. Finally, Gwen took matters into her own hands. We need to come to terms with this and be equal. She took out her mobile phone and called her friend. Hello, Carolyn. This is Gwen, Gwendolyn Harrelson. Yes, I was hoping that you could represent my friend in her divorce proceedings. Her name is Sophia Barron. Yes, her husband's name is Michael Barron. Excuse me? What? Yes, I understand. Thank you very much. What did all this mean? She's already poisonous. It was Carolyn Herrera. She's a shark, and she hates bastard husbands almost as much as she hates cheating spouses. Then she heard Sophia's name. She had already heard through the grapevine what happened. She said that if she had taken on this matter, her husband would have divorced her. They have five children, are serious Catholics, and both know Michael and Sophia. She also knows about this asshole, Stephanie said. Let me try. She took out her mobile phone and dialed a number. Yes, this is Stephanie Jameson. I need to talk to Brett Walker. Yes, regarding the divorce proceedings. Hello, Brett. I need to talk to you about divorce proceedings. Oh, it's not your client. Hmm. Well, thank you. You really are the bearer of bad news, honey. Damn, I don't know who else to talk to about this. He heard what happened and said, 
You deserve what's going to happen to you. He also said that he wouldn't go against Steve Dawson, even if his mother's life depended on it. Sophia's heed fell back onto the table, but this time it hit her hands. So, I got down to business. I had several friends who could do some mischief for me. It was nothing serious, and I didn't want them to get caught. Sugar in the gas tank. Color his entire beautiful car with balloons. Once that was all fixed, they proceeded to clean the hood, sides, roof, and rear quarters using an air sander and roto-zip tool. They then proceeded to flatten all four tires and cut the sidewalls. Expensive cars were smashed to smithereens. This retaliation will continue for the foreseeable future. The price didn't matter. She had trouble finding a lawyer, but eventually found a feminist Nazi who agreed to take her case. So it all came down to a family meeting. It was a cold Friday morning in Chicago, almost as cold as my house. The guys flew in from the east and west coasts. My son brought his future bride with him. I hoped he made the right decision. This meeting would be a very emotional discussion. Their mother was still living in the hotel, and they didn't understand why. I told them they would have to talk to her tomorrow. They asked where she had been. She currently resides at the Peninsula Hotel. If you want to see her or talk to her, try there. I tried, Dad. I was informed that her cell phone was no longer working. Why did it happen? It's disabled. Call her at work or leave a message at the front desk. I wonder why she hasn't called you yet. Hmm, interesting. My daughter looked at my son and his fiancée and asked, What the hell is going on? Your mother has a problem. I have no right to discuss this. Talk to her, please. You'll understand why if she talks to you. They tried to contact her, but to no avail. Through her secretary, she said that she would talk to them on Saturday morning at 10 due. I took the kids out to dinner, and we had a pleasant, if a little tense, time. Saturday morning dawned clear and cold, as expected in Chicago at this time of year. It struck ten or less. The children drank coffee and waited for their mother to appear. She appeared with the Honorable Kathleen O'Hara in tow. Really, Sophia? Have you brought your lawyer? From which child? My client did not want her character to be denigrated in front of her children. At your funeral... I led them into the living room. The children rushed to greet their mother, wanting to know what was happening. My client has no comment, Ms. O'Hara said. What? Who the hell is this, Mom? I am Miss Sophia Doe's lawyer. Your father is suing her for divorce. Ball game. I just sat there grinning and didn't say anything. Steve told me if this happened, not to say anything but the truth or nothing at all. Looking back, this was good advice. My son started first. What the hell is she talking about, Mom? Please, please contact me with any questions. What is she talking about, Mom? Ashley asked. Contact me, Miss. I am your parents' representative. Mom, is this true? Miss Barron, I will no longer instruct you. That's when Tara spoke. Shut up, bitch. Suffice it to say that Miss O'Hara was a little shocked. And who are you? I'm Miss Tara Longoria. I am the fiancé of Mr. Michael Barron, Jr. That makes me family, and that's more than I can say about you. Well, this was getting interesting. Michael Jr.'s mother did not know about this. Actually, I didn't notice it before, but now I noticed the diamond on her left hand. I grinned and stood up from my seat and walked over to my new soon-to-be daughter-in-law. I gave her a bear hug and kissed her on the cheek. I turned to my grinning son, hugged him, and shook his hand. Congratulations, son. He grinned again and said, Careful, old man. You know what they say for her. All this time, his mother fell into catatonia. Oh, my baby! Sophia exclaimed. Sorry, Mom. You'll have to talk through your mouthpiece. She choked. Miss O'Hara said, I think we're done here, and stood up to leave. That's it. I've had enough. Sit down, bitch. This is a family meeting. She knew this and brought a lawyer anyway. You can either remain silent or leave. Her children and I want to talk to Sophia. What do you choose? It became quiet. Miss O'Hara sat down with a distressed expression on her face. So, Sophia, apart from what was said here today, I didn't tell our children anything. Bye. I'm giving you the first chance. Don't screw this one up either. 
I shot a warning glance at the lawyer as she opened her mouth. She immediately closed it. Sophia blushed and, stuttering, finally said, Your father wants a divorce. Michael Jr. gave me the look that usually kills. Why, Mom? She lowered her eyes and said, I don't know, in a quiet voice. Michael, Ashley, and Tara pierced me with their gazes. I was in deep shit, but I had an advantage. The truth, Sophia. Is this how you want to deal with it? She began to sob. My turn? She sobbed a little more. Fine. Your mother and I went to a party last Friday night. She talked to a man who invited her to go home with him for the whole weekend, and he gave her meaningless sex, pleasures that she would never believe in. He touched her inappropriately and pleasured her on the ballroom balcony, while the woman who succumbed to his advances five years ago told me exactly what he was going to do and say to her. Then they would come back and your mother would tell me that she was going home with him and spending the weekend servicing him and getting sex from him. To my eternal shame, I did nothing to keep her. She is a mature woman and can make her own decisions. I could cause a scene and probably have two of his bodyguards beat the crap out of me. But I didn't do anything. And I'm ashamed. I'm depressed. However, your mother did exactly as predicted. And she was adamant about this. This weekend was exactly what she wanted, so she took it. I haven't heard anything from her all weekend, not a sound from her. Until Sunday afternoon, approximately 4.45 p.m., she texted me that she was heading home and would be there in about 25 minutes. She arrived at about 5.25 and was dropped off by this bastard. My temperament was beginning to surface. She came up as if nothing had happened. Her keys didn't fit because I changed the locks. I didn't want to risk her bringing that asshole into my house. You sold my car? I told you, bitch. It was my car. I bought it. My name was on the bill of sale, registration, and insurance. I bought it so you could have a car, and I didn't give it away the way you did with your body. I gave you the money. She quickly unstuck. Her mascara ran, as did her eyeliner. She widened her eyes. But you want to know what the catch was? To the party she wore her diamond necklace, my 24th anniversary gift to her, and Christmas sapphire earrings. When she returned home on Sunday, she still had them on her, in addition to her wedding ring and engagement ring. I took the ring from her, because we were no longer married, and the engagement ring belonged to my grandmother. But do you know what she no longer had? What did she give away so unceremoniously? What was her favorite piece of jewelry? an item that she had to have because she was so fascinated by it, even though it was just a cheap facsimile. I once told her that I would make her a much better quality replica, the ring that she loved and wore almost constantly. My daughter and son looked at each other, and when they said, Lady Di's ring, did she lose it? She fell to the floor, sobbing. Yes, Lady Di's ring. She didn't have it. And do you know why? Please don't, Michael. Please. He wanted to get something as a memory. She gave it the same just as she gave her body. My children flinched at the same time, and Tara gasped. She turned and hugged Michael. Sophia was hopeless. Stop it. Please stop. I will sign everything. Just stop. So I spent the weekend and the rest of the week getting everything in order. And cried. Oh, how I cried. That's why I have nothing left now. That's when the roundhouse kick hit me. Ashley said, Dad, of course you can forgive her for one minor offense. Yes, Dad, it was just a one-time thing. Mom deserves better from you. Get over it and get it over with. Ashley threw the first punch. I could never hit a swing ball. Michael's response was strike number two. I'm behind in the count. I was shocked. I didn't expect this. Was I the only one who suffered so much? Is this all my fault? Are my children suddenly brain dead? Have you heard anything of what we discussed here? Do you know what she did? Let's find out. Tell me, Sophia, did you have an inappropriate conversation with a man who was not your husband last Friday night? I was talking to a handsome man. Ball first. Answer the question. Yes. I suppose I could do it. Ball second, I looked better. She couldn't find the plate. And you allowed him to touch you intimately? the same way you might allow your husband? It didn't mean anything. This gentleman was so sophisticated, high and tight. 
Third ball. It's clear. So then. He told you to tell your husband that you were going to go home with him and have sex with him. Yes, but I'm a matura woman and, uh, I... Dirty reception. I was still involved. Understand. And when you came home with that asshole, did you sleep with him? You pleased him and allowed him to pleasure you. Because I was not there. I don't know. So tell us what you did all weekend. Have you played Scrabble? Have you discussed poetry? Have you written letters to your children? Have you even to call your husband? I didn't think so. You're a fucking cheater. She threw one ball at my head, but I dodged it. I really wanted this, and I took what I wanted, she said. Understand that I will get you to testify under oath about what happened that weekend. Then the world will know, if they haven't already. And the young lady who served you on Monday? She's actually a lawyer. She works at Steve's company. She volunteered to do this because her mother did the same stupid thing and destroyed their family. This is what prompted her to become a lawyer. Sophia knew she was in trouble. She couldn't stand it again. All bravado disappeared. She stood and looked at her future ex-husband and her now three children. I'll sign everything and send it to Peter this afternoon. O'Hara began. I don't think it's in your best interest. You're fired, Kathleen. Send your bill to my office and I will arrange for a check to be delivered to you. Right in the middle. I drove deep into the central areas of Comiskey Park. Sophia walked towards the door and turned to me. Goodbye, Michael. Kids, I'll call you tomorrow and we can meet. She left and the door closed behind her. Miss O'Hara remained standing in the living room. Well, she told me, I hope you're happy. She's desperate. Bitch, get out of my house! I roared. The lawyer snorted, turned, and left. That's when it all started. Dad, how could you be so cruel? Treat your mom the way you did. This is from my daughter. What the hell is wrong with you, Dad? Are you seriously going to divorce your mom because of this? I'm so glad I sent them both to college, I thought to myself. Do you think I should tolerate this? Is this what you two want from your marriages? I turned and stared at Tara. If that's the case, then quickly run away now, Tara. She gasped and stared at me. I would never do anything like that, Dad. This is wrong on all fronts. Of course, Dad. You can't go through with this. Michael, it's a done deal. And if you can't handle it, don't involve me in any functions in the future. Any functions. I looked him straight in the eyes and held his gaze. He has my character, and I saw how he reared up. Ashley, on the other hand, was in a whiny mood. Dad, how could you be so cruel? You saw the state Mom was in when she left. She's in a lot of pain. You must forgive her bad behavior and accept her back. I was stunned. My children stood by their mother in her infidelity. Tara finally broke the ice and said, Dad, this might make Mikey angry, but you're right. She didn't even take responsibility or apologize. Not that it would matter, but showing remorse would at least be the right thing to do. From then on, things got tense. About two hours later, they called their mother and agreed to meet her. I gave Michael a duplicate key and told him to drive carefully. He looked at me and asked if I wanted to go with them. You've got to be kidding me! I roared. Michael looked at me intently and then said he couldn't understand me. I stepped up my campaign against the assholes, and my minions seemed to be doing a good job and enjoying themselves. One of the things they did was change his license plate and then anonymously report the car to police as stolen. I was impressed that they had such easy access to his car, even though he kept both his Ferrari and his Cadillac in the garage. I also had them follow him down the Dan Ryan Expressway with a neat little black box that could hack into the car's computer. They slowed and isolated him in the middle lane, and when he moved into the right exit lane, they caused the Ferrari to swerve and hit a utility pole. This caused significant damage and resulted in him spending 10 days in hospital. Meanwhile, his insurance skyrocketed, and he lost his original insurer. This guy was luckier than you could imagine. Not only that, but every time the cops got involved, they didn't exactly bust their asses to solve the crime. They knew about his reputation and seemed to turn a blind eye to his difficulties. I heard that most were pretty sure that some pissed-off hubby would get a kick out of it. God bless the boys in blue.
That evening, Steve called me and he said that she had personally delivered the documents. He had a good judge in mind. His son was the victim of an asshole three years ago, and he promised us that he would file the paperwork for both a divorce and an alienation of affection lawsuit. Steve didn't know if we'd get any support for the adultery case, but it was on the table. The kids were cooler towards me, even more so than during the initial confrontation, and only Tara said anything to me about agreeing with me. About a week later, they returned to school and the divorce continued. After the final decision, I was a free man, and it was approaching the Cancer Society ball. I knew it would be there, and I really wanted to burn it. One of my henchmen happened to run into me at a cafe we frequented and gave me an idea that was so good that I knew I had to be there to see it. I called Lana and asked if she was going to go. She said she received an invitation but didn't think about going. I told her she should participate and would like to come with me. She thought about it and said that if I was going to have fun, she didn't want to miss it. We came and mixed with the crowd. Then I noticed that Sophia was there with her friends, Gwendolyn and Stephanie. She tried to get this idiot to talk, but he didn't want anything to do with her. He has his sights set on a hot petite blonde in a tight aqua dress. Two thugs cornered her husband as he tried to attack her. He took her to a separate room and closed the door. I approached my husband and told him that I could help him if he trusted me, and did what I told him. He looked panicked, and Lana started talking to him, explaining what was about to happen. I told him that if he agreed with everything, then he and his wife would still return home together, just a little worse for wear. Otherwise, if he threw a tantrum, he would probably get his ass kicked. He looked at the two thugs and seemed to deflate. I told him that if he listened to me, we would put him in touch with people who would help him. He would also be able to boss his wife around and embarrass her to the point where she would apologize to him and be very embarrassed, he reluctantly agreed. At these words, the conspirators left the side room, led by their wife. She walked up to him, made her little speech, and they turned and left. We let them go about five meters away, and then the three of us followed them. They stopped to get their coats while the thugs went and picked up the Cadillac. We got out just as they were opening the back doors and they slipped in, and he grabbed her ass and kissed her. They closed the back door, and then goon number two got into the front passenger seat. My husband almost lost his temper. I warned him. Wait with this. So, according to the plan that my friend came up with, two of his partners worked at an auto parts store and gave the asshole's office a coupon for 50% off interior cleaning with a free hand car wash. While they were doing this, they placed three skunk-scented smoke bombs, complete with electronic detonators, under the seats. The car's brake lights flashed and it began to slowly drive away. He had driven about three meters along the ring road when the car braked suddenly, hitting the taxi with the front right side of the car. The doors burst open and four people spilled out, choking and coughing. They vomited in the driveway and smoke poured out of the car. The blonde's top was falling out of her dress and her underwear was lying on the sidewalk outside the door. The woman's husband ran to his wife, only staggering slightly, as he helped her up Dewey to the smell and smoke. I smirked as the idiot tried to stand up and limped a little on his still mobile leg. The police arrived when the asshole walked up to his ex-lover and took her hand. The husband hit him in the stomach, and when he staggered, he kicked him below the waist. Record for counting. He pulled his wife in, despite the skunk smell she gave off, and began chewing on her on the way to their car. I smiled and turned to Lana. One point in favor of the good guys. I gave my husband a business card with my cell phone number on the back and told him to call that number the next day. I took out my cell phone and dialed the number on the speed dial. Yes, answered the voice. Outstanding, I said. It's you, sir. He didn't answer. The connection was interrupted. I gave my husband a business card with my cell phone number on the back and asked him to call me to talk. Lana and I went home to her townhouse, and I felt her charm for the first time. She attacked me in the hallway of her house as soon as the front door closed, and by the time we were in her bedroom, she and I were naked and having several different types of sex. So, 
After the divorce, I wasn't exactly a monk, and I had a few more dates, mostly with Jung, willing ladies who wanted to advance their careers. It appears that wealthy older men were quite desirable. The sex wasn't about us. It was all about her. She was on a mission to rid her soul of guilt. She was an animal to me, and I was just a means to an end. When she used me, she began to sob, crying her eyes out and screaming, Forgive me, Lawrence. I'm so terribly sorry. Please forgive me, my love. Lawrence was the name of her late husband. She collapsed on me and continued to cry. Slowly, she returned to her normal behavior and blushed. I'm so sorry. I've never behaved like this before. I feel so ashamed. What must you be thinking about me? I hugged her as she started crying again. Everything is fine. You're just emotionally upset and haven't dealt with the pain yet. I know almost exactly how you feel. She curled up into a ball and continued to whimper. I've never reacted like that before. After my fiasco, I was with several men, and it was just physical release. I felt some kind of connection with you. I'm connected to you somehow. I am so sorry. We talked a little. The sex was good, although a little emotional. I didn't know how I felt about this woman. We slept for a while, and then I got up, took a shower, got dressed, pulled the blanket over her sleeping figure, and kissed her. She stirred and looked at me. Are you going to be okay? I asked. She smiled and said, Now I will feel better. Please call me. I will do so. I promise. I left and went home. Months passed. Lana and I have become even closer. Things moved a little slower in my family. Michael and Tara got married. My son told me that they invited his mother, and she said she would be there. Deal with it, Dad. I told him I would do so. I didn't attend the wedding. Tara's parents were not aware of the situation. They were unhappy with me. My wonderful daughter-in-law took them to the heart of the problem. Tara's mom was shocked, and Tara's dad was furious. The serious Italian family immediately began to avoid my ex-wife. Tara's grandmother went so far as to spit in Sophia's face. The culmination was when one of her friends accosted Sophia and caused a scene. She couldn't stand it and ran away from the reception. I sent Tara a nice note with the check. I sent her parents a letter of conciliation and explained that I couldn't stand being in the same room as my ex-wife, let alone being in the same state. I emailed my son to tell him to fuck off. The wedding took place in Kenilworth, New Jersey. A year later, my son and daughter-in-law gave birth to a bouncy baby boy. At Tara's insistence, he was named Michael Giovanni Barron in honor of his father and two grandfathers. She invited me to the christening. I was overjoyed. I went to Newark, New Jersey and got a hotel room. I walked into St. Michael the Archangel Catholic Church in Palisades Park, New Jersey, and met my namesake. I was in seventh heaven. Then I saw Sophia come in with someone on her arm. I almost lost consciousness. She came closer. I turned to my son and said, She is here, isn't she? Tara grabbed my hand and said, Please, Dad, just this time. I'm sorry, honey. I handed her the envelope, turned on my heel and walked it out. I went back to my hotel, check it out, went back to the airport, boarded the next flight to Chicago, and had it home. After that... I almost had to change my phone number. Was I underage? And what? It is what it is. Time passed, and Michael got a job in Chicago at the Department of Justice. I called and congratulated him and Tara and asked about my grandson. They said he was fine and wanted to see his grandfather. I smirked, and then I heard her voice in the background. Who's there, dear? I heard. I hung up and turned off my phone. After that, I became sullen. I hardly spoke to anyone except Lena, who became my good friend and bed partner. It appears that my campaign of terror against Darren Watson is still bearing fruit. Mr. Watson tried to find out who was targeting him, but to no avail. Even my son and daughter-in-law have heard about it. These were still just minor incidents, but they became legends. As time went by, about three months later, Tara called me from work. Dad, little Michael turns three next Saturday. We're throwing a party and we'd like you to be there. I wish I could, honey, but you know how I feel. I'm bad company and I don't want to ruin everything because... 
mother is not invited. I told my husband, your son, that she would not be welcome here that day. I will break him if he invites her or asks her to be there. I really love this girl. My son doesn't deserve her. It will be an honor for me to attend. I have the time and date. I called my secretary and asked her to free the whole day for me. I called a FAO. Schwartz asked them to purchase a Tonka dump truck, bright yellow, of course, a wrap it up and ship it to my office. I had one when I was a kid and Michael got one for Christmas one year. It was the type of toy that was meant to be played with. No electronics or fancy used metal with solid rubber tires. He fell and rolled and you had to play with him. They couldn't keep them in stock. It seemed to be very popular, especially with grandfathers. That Saturday morning, I showed up at Tensor. We had a great time. Lunch, cake, coffee, and then opened gifts. I struck up a conversation with Tara's parents and they said they understood why their daughter spoke so highly of me. And her father thought the dump truck would be a great gift. Reminds me of one I had as a child. Good decision, Michael. I liked him. Little Michael drove the truck all over his backyard. It was wearing him out. His mother and grandmother put him down for a nap. Even my son was polite. He brought me a beer and said, why don't you go sit in the backyard, old man, and relax? I took him up on his offer and found an Adirondack chair in the middle of the lawn. Life was good when I took a sip of Bud. That's when a shadow crossed my face and I looked up to see my ex-wife. She had a glass of what looked like white wine. Hi, Michael. Do you mind if I join you? I looked at her intently and said nothing. She placed her huge bag over her shoulder on the ground. She sat down and crossed her ankles, a position she often took to turn me on. Not this time. I looked at her intently, and she shuddered. You're not going to make things easy, are you? Well, Michael told me that you would be here and that his wife said that under no circumstances should I be invited here today. It wouldn't be good for him, but he thought it would be worth settling things between us. Michael, I think we deserve a second chance. I want to wake up with you in my arms and grow old with you. I know we are meant for each other, and I have been very lonely the last few years. What do you think? Can we give this another chance? I was studying with my ex-wife. Over the past few years, she has aged significantly and gained about 10 kilograms. She began to develop a nervous tick, and she constantly shuddered. She still hasn't apologized once and just blithely introduced her deluxe room. I studied her and wondered where the woman I loved and married had gone. I sighed, finished my beer, and stood up. Well, she said, what do you think about it? Not just no, but damn, no, Sophia. See you in hell because that's where I've been for the last three and a half years, cheater. A little harsh? Maybe. But suddenly I felt good about myself. I turned and walked away. I walked across the lawn to the patio, up onto the porch, and through the sliding glass doors into the kitchen. I ran into my son who encouraged me with a sinister grin. Well, how did it go, Dad? Not so bad, right? The sound of a pistol shot was deafening, and the silence was broken by the screams of guests pouring into the backyard. I grabbed my son's hand and looked at him intently. I think your mother got hurt. You better go check on her. He turned pale and rushed into the backyard. I grabbed a bottle of water, walked into the living room, and sat on the couch alone. The police showed up and took statements. It's incredible what damage 40 KLA does. A gun can do something to a person's head. I answered their questions. Did I know my wife was suicidal? Did she give any indication that she was going to commit suicide? I told them I hadn't spoken to my ex-wife in over three years. I spoke to my sister-in-law, and through her tears I told her that I understood that she had nothing to do with this. I left and went home. I had barely crossed the threshold when the phone rang. It was Lana. She heard on the news what happened. I told her I would handle it. She wanted to know if she should come. No, I'll be fine, but thanks for the offer. On Monday, I returned to my office. I called our best crime photographer into my office. Stu Phillips was Chicago's best and received several local and national awards for his work. Stu, I need a favor. I don't know if you are aware that my ex-wife committed suicide on Saturday at my grandson's birthday party. Everyone has pretty much heard about it, boss. We're sorry about that, even though you weren't close. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. How friendly are you with criminologists? Do you think you could get a copy of the photographs of her skull, her head? A 10 by 12 color photograph would be best. He looked at me strangely, and I saw the wheels spinning. This is a personal favor for me. If you can't, I understand. No, I can do it. I have several people I can talk to. They are in my debt. I don't think it will be too difficult. Just weird, I guess. Thank you, Stu. Now I am your debtor. Give me a few days, boss. A plan was forming in my head to put the finishing touches on my campaign of revenge. The wake took place over three days at an upscale funeral home on the west side. It was a closed casket, as there wasn't much they could do with her face. She had many friends and acquaintances. Several hundred people were present. I wasn't one of them. There were rumors that my absence was conspicuous. The day of her funeral was overcast, gray, and pouring rain. I was cold and damp. The funeral procession consisted of four cars with flowers and three limousines, in addition to a hearse. There were about 60 cars in the procession. Again, I was not among them. I was already at the cemetery, standing in the foggy rain in a grove of trees about 30 meters from the grave. I watched as the coffin was unloaded and carried to the other side. A large crowd gathered, and the priest said some nice things. This made me wonder who he was talking about. I was amazed he showed up at all, seeing as she killed herself. My son's head turned. He was probably looking around for me. The service finally ended and people began to leave. Now, only immediate family and close friends remain. The crowd slowly thinned out until only my children remained. Then they headed to the limousines, and the last one was my son, standing in the open back door of the Cadillac and looking around. He finally gave up and got into the car. The car slowly pulled into the main driveway and turned onto the street. He disappeared into the thickening fog. I emerged from the trees just as the cemetery workers were preparing to cover the grave. I walked over to her coffin and thought about urinating on it, but the anger and hatred disappeared. Somehow, I don't know how, it all evaporated. I looked down at the love of my life, sniffed, and said goodbye. I forgive you. Even if you don't think you did anything wrong, I forgive you. I loved you, but not anymore. The next day I came to work to find a large manila envelope on my desk. I sat and looked at him. I knew what was in it, but I didn't enjoy looking at it. Finally, I opened the envelope and took out the photograph. It wasn't pretty, but it was Sophia. The Children's Society charity evening was a week later, on the fourth anniversary of the start of this damn mess. I called Lana and asked if she wanted to come with me. She readily agreed, and I told her I would pick her up around 8.00 p.m., I called the gossip editor and asked her to come to my office. Then I called our investigative reporter and our photographer. I asked them to rise too and waited for the military council to meet. They got together and I outlined what I wanted. Next weekend, I want to publish an expose about Darren Watson. Just in time, there were several comments. Only documented factual sworn data supported by sworn testimony and affidavits. No speculation. We must have enough facts to crucify him. I want photographers to be there at the charity event to document everything. Then I want to interview the organizers to determine the gross receipts. Can we do it? I don't think that will be a problem, boss. We'll have everything ready for the launch on Friday at midnight, leaving room for new photos. Thank you all, I said. A week later, I accompanied Lana Tooley to a party. We arrived, dropped off our coats, and chatted with a few friends. There he was, circling like a great white shark, looking for his next victim. Finally, he noticed a pretty brunette with waist-length hair who had just sent her husband to the bar for more. Her champagne glass was only a third full. She was smiling as Watson sidled up to her and smiled. Her husband had just walked up to the bar and was waiting to be served. Watson leaned over and whispered in her ear. She smiled and blushed slightly. He stroked her hand, then her shoulder. Then she shuddered and moved closer to him. 
I noticed that one thug took a position closer to the balcony doors, and the second began to approach my husband. He turned and suddenly drew inappropriate attention to his wife. He walked towards them, and the idiot intensified his seduction. I turned to Lana and told her, It's time! She moved away from me, moved slightly closer to thug number two, and began to wait. Watson whispered something in her ear and took her hand, heading towards the balcony. She smiled and seemed to be enjoying herself. I made my move and stood between them. Sorry, you don't know me, but this idiot made the same proposals to my wife almost four and a half years ago. She succumbed to his advances and went away with him for the weekend. It destroyed our marriage and led to the fact that... At these words, I reached over and pulled out a photograph of my wife's disfigured face. This is my wife. She committed suicide last week. I put the photograph in her hand and she turned pale, shuddered and gasped, dropping the glass from her hands. It shattered, causing gasps and screams from the surrounding crowd. This is your chance not to make the same mistake she did. I sneakily signaled to the photographers around me and noticed that Thug Dar 2 started moving towards me. The startled woman looked at the photograph and then turned to the asshole. You asshole! And her hand slapped him across the face, her nails running viciously across his cheek. Around this time, his bodyguard almost approached us, and Lana intervened herself. Oh, excuse me she said. I turned to leave, offering this asshole my right shoulder. Watson glared at me. It's you, he growled and reached for my shoulder. Let me go, I growled and turned not towards him, but to the left, using the inertia to turn around and drive my right fist right into his nose. His nose caved in and his upper jaw was cracked. His right cheekbone was cracked and part of his nose was pierced through his eye. He fell down like ten kilograms of shit. His thugs didn't know what to do and just stood over him while cameras clicked and whirred around them. Lana took my hand as the brunette's husband approached her. Please take me home now. The brunette sobbed. We moved towards the center of the dance floor as the crowd parted for us. I stopped and turned to face the crowd. I should be ashamed of what this man got away with, I said, pointing at Watson. Surely you all should be ashamed of what he did by simply donating money to charity. The charity must be held accountable, along with Chicago and the community at large, for its actions. An article will appear in the newspaper on Saturday and Sunday with the facts and courageous statements of his victims. Read this and take it to heart. Lana pulled me along before I lost control, and we made our way through the parting crowd. We got home and she put ice on my aching fist, and then we had sex until we died. The consequences were swift and severe. Although there is no law prohibiting his actions, public opinion was much more brutal. He became an outcast, and charities shunned him and his money. Contributions to children's donations dropped by 65%. Cancer Foundation and AMA returned his donation. The Diabetes Association returned his check. The American Heart Association removed him from its board and the Archdiocese of Chicago censured him and returned his contribution. Even the NAACP told him, Don't call us, and we sure as hell won't call you. It turns out he was a stockbroker, and negative duplicity caught up with him. He lost his license and his job. He tried to sue me and had me arrested, but it turned out that the husband of the woman he was trying to seduce was the Cook County State's attorney, and began his own investigation into his actions. The suit hasn't gone anywhere. He was found two weeks after his dismissal in an alley near the old stockyards, beaten half to death, his manhood severed, stuffed in his mouth, and his throat slit. Too bad an ending. Lana and I became a couple. We are exclusive, but I don't know if marriage is in our future. My children gradually resumed communication with me, and we began to bond with her children. It's a difficult job that led to many emotional scenes, but we make the best of a bad situation. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one.